Have you ever wondered how things work or why they work? When you turn on a faucet, you get water, drinkable water. When you throw on a light switch, the light comes on. Well, most of the time. I'm Will Howard and I've wondered about these things and always wanted to know. And we're going to find out today. We're going to go down the holes and up the poles and find out how just everything works at Easton Utilities that got its start in the early 19th century. Come with me. We're with Pete Lesher. Pete is a local historian. And Pete, when did utilities start in Easton? We're, we just celebrated 300th anniversary, so the town is a typical old American town. When did they start getting utilities? We got them piece by piece. The gas utility here started in 1858. People use that for, for gas lights. For right. gas lights. So the town had gas lanterns? Uh, gas. A few gas street lights, a few, few street lights, but mostly for, for lighting in homes uh, or businesses. Uh, then we got a water utility in, in the 1880s, and in 1888, finally, an electric plant. But all of these were private enterprises. Okay. Uh, none of these were, were owned by the municipality. And it wasn't until after Easton sort of reorganized in the early 20th century under Mayor Martin Higgins that a real push was put on by, the, by Mayor Higgins to create publicly owned uh, utilities, to, in some cases, acquire these private enterprises, uh, and, and, and to build new. The first thing that they did was to build a public sewer system. In 1911, they authorized that when it was going by 1914. So I, t I take it the streets weren't paved in this period of time? The, the streets were just getting paved at this point. They were putting curbs and gutters and street paving. All kinds of public improvements were happening. A lot of activity happening in the town of Easton in that sort of first and second de decade of the 20th century. So 1914, we get not only our first sewer system in town, it was the first complete municipal sewer system anywhere in the state of Maryland. Baltimore didn't have one. None of the other towns in Maryland had one that early. The same year we bought the water company so that that goes from being a private enterprise to being a municipally owned utility. And what date was that again? It's also 1914. The following year they built an electric power plant. They thought that they could do it for $35,000, and they managed to do it for even less than that, $30,000. So we're in that same building That's now, right. that they built back Nin 1915, they, they got it going. And uh, the, the whole idea was the, pri the, private, the privately run power company was not performing very well. For starters, they only operated from dusk until midnight, maybe. And so there was a lot of demand to say, let's get us better service. We'd, we'd like to have uh, electric lights all through the night. And it might even be nice to have electric lights during the daytime because uh, that can be useful to business, that can be useful to industry. Uh, so this, this was a, still a new idea, so a new what luxury. Other, what other utility that we're not specifically going to talk about in this program, but were the phone telephone wires? I know looking at old photographs of Easton, we see just wires and wires and wires everywhere. And, and that, of course, that of course would have been uh, well. Certainly, phone wires first. That's never public. Uh, that's never a municipally owned utility. Right. Uh, but yes, then then the electric. Uh, the le there's some electric that's in this privately operated system, but then the municipally owned system comes in in 1914, and it's another first, because we were the first municipally owned electric utility to go with alternating current. Back then, Edison's utilities was all doing direct current. And Edison, because he had the patents on direct current, was really cautioning people away from going with alternating current. It, it said that he invented the electric chair to execute people, to demonstrate the danger of alternating current. And of course, we know which side won. The entire electric grid on the country today is run on alternating current. So somebody born in 1855 would have just gone through this miraculous change of the world. Completely, much like the what our generation, much like what our generation has gone through with the digital revolution, it was just as transformative. Now, a few years later, just a few years later, 1923, the town completed this utility system by purchasing the gas plant that had been started. That was the first of these utilities to be started privately. It was the last to be acquired by the municipality. When we come back, we'll get a tour behind closed doors through the rest of the plant, including the very, very neat operation center. We're with Jeff Oxnan, Vice President of Operations for Easton Utilities. And I gotta tell you something, Jeff, 
I'm a little nervous uh, here. I've done skydiving before and I fly, but I'm scared to death at the height that we are right now. We're doing this to illustrate the size of this giant generator. How many of these do you have? That's right. We, this is one of uh, 18 electric generators that we have here in Easton that all together are capable of carrying the entire electric load for the town of Easton. That's amazing, especially with the size of the town of Easton today. It is. It's a, it's a good amount of energy, but um, you'll notice right now they're quiet. We're not generating electricity right now. All of the electricity that we're using is coming into Easton off the electric grid, but these are here in case we need them. These are pistons. How do very, you, very big pistons. How do you check the oil on this thing? Well, let me show you, but we'll have to go downstairs to take a look. You first. Just like your uh, car engine, it's right there. Oh. Wow, it's like a sword. Are you quart low? There's about 30,000 quarts in 30, this engine. 30,000 quarts? How do you change your oil? Very carefully. I'm gonna have uh, William, one of our operators, show us how. The, there's a tank outside that has all the oil, then it's connected here to this, uh, to this hose, and William will show you where it goes in this giant engine. And you just fill her up like that. That's amazing. We're now leaving the older section of our uh, power plant one and into the newer section where we've got a uh, significant portion of our generation fleet. I'm still kind of hung up on the oil. So how often do you change the oil? A pretty regular basis throughout the year, depending on the amount that we use the engines. And what do you do with the old oil? The old oil is collected up uh, and then recycled. And taken away. Recycled. Taken away taken okay. away from here, yeah. Recycled okay. off campus. Now, I'm amazed with these enormous tools. They're absolutely huge. So, we probably don't have much use for this. And a lot of use for this. That's right, when you're fixing an engine this big, uh, you need a tool that big. This would be for your car, that's for the power plant. We're in the control room right now where we monitor and control all of the electric generation in, our, uh, in the utility company as well as other aspects of the utility system. Now originally this was the board that we were using to uh, control all that. We still use a good part of it today but we're getting far more high tech and using uh, a lot more on-screen monitoring and control. It's very impressive. So someone is here 24 hours a day? 24-7, 365 days a year. There's always somebody manning this room. Can we take a look here? Absolutely. Now scroll up and then move up. Today's controls are uh, highly technical and digitized. We run the entire utilities uh, out of this area and we can monitor everything uh, that's going on with our system. Here we've got uh, information not only about the uh, electric system but also our wastewater plant which is clear on the other side of town. We're able to in real time monitor what's happening and uh, what needs to be done. It's really impressive. And these are security lights? We have security cameras. Uh, we monitor what's happening inside our facility. We monitor uh, weather. Uh, we monitor uh, energy usage throughout the area. So there's a lot of information that's pouring in here all at once. And if you call Eastern Utilities after normal business hours, this is where your telephone call is going to come. So are you watching the weather there on that green screen? Actually, that's showing us right now what electric consumption is throughout the entire mid-Atlantic region. And that really impacts what the price of electricity is. The price of electricity changes all day long, every five minutes, and it's based on the amount of energy people are using. So we've got a beautiful day today, and people aren't using the heater, they aren't using the electricity, so the price is nice and low, and use is nice and low. So the darker green there is higher use? The uh, more intense the color, the higher use would be, and the higher reflected as higher price. So where does our, our power coming from right now? Right now, electricity is coming into Easton from all over this region. We're part of the world's largest uh, wholesale energy market. And that means that there are electric generators all throughout the mid-Atlantic region 
that are putting enough energy into the grid to make sure that it powers everything that's on the grid at the moment. So they're constantly adjusting. The more people start using electricity, they gotta bring more generators on. The less people use, they start taking them out. So there's an operator that makes sure there's always the right amount of electric, electric generation to meet electric demand. And if there's not, you can throw a switch and turn on all of your generators. We have the ability here in Easton to carry all the load of the town uh, with our generators right here. That's uh, pretty unique these days to have that ability. It sure is. So has it ever happened that you've, we've lost power everywhere and then we have to turn these on? Yes, it has. Uh, it's very rare. Um, but that's what we call a, uh, a black start, where we have to bring on all of the generators from scratch with no energy in, in town. Um, so, it's a, so everybody's lights go off and everybody's phone starts ringing here. Right, well we start to get the calls in and um, we have to bring the power on uh, a little bit at a time. You can't bring it all right back on. So we start firing up our generators. It takes about 45 minutes to get our entire fleet of generators back up and running. And then you stage that in different parts of... Absolutely. You've got to stage it in different parts because you can run the risk of the uh, demand on the generators being so high that it'll crash the system again. So you very systematically bring the town back section by section by section. Now I've checked the rates of utilities and Eastern Utilities seems to be less than most, most other companies. Correct. You do that on purpose. Well, we try awfully hard to do that. Uh, one of the real advantages of a municipal utility company, not only are we locally owned and controlled, but uh, municipal utility companies like Eastern Utilities typically have lower prices uh, than other forms of utility ownership. Well, that's great. It's very reassuring to know that all of these measures are in place and all your people are here. How many employees do you have? We have 133 employees. Well, they all do a great job. Well, thank you. Now in your new building, which was built in 2000. Correct. So I kind of see a transition from what we've seen to where we are mm -hmm. now, of a transition from the industrial era to now the technological era. Absolutely. Uh, the utilities has evolved sort of with society. Uh, we started in a very analog world with the, the power generation right here for all of our use um, to the point where we hooked into the grid. We had the old knobs and dials and now we have a fully digital uh, monitoring system. As Pete said, the first utility in Easton was gas. Mm -hmm. And now you still have gas. We haven't talked about that. That's right. We have a, a natural gas utility. We provide natural gas service throughout town. It's in pipes that go underground to our customers and uh, right into their homes or offices. And the natural gas that we use comes to us from a pipeline that runs all the way from the Gulf of Mexico here. That's amazing. And you've got a tank with 300,000, 30,000 gallons or 300,000? 300, 300,000 gallons of diesel fuel over there. Okay. Different than the uh, natural gas. Our natural gas is either delivered instantly over the pipeline or is stored in abandoned mines in, in, to the west of here. Uh, and then we draw it back out as we need it on those really cold days. Now the new technology is solar. Mm -hmm. And you have customers now that are selling you energy? And we do, and it's very exciting. Technology is changing and the way we try to make electricity is changing. We now have a handful of customers who are uh, generating some of their own electricity by putting solar panels on their homes. So for part of the year, they're able to generate not only what they need, but to sell back some of what they need. Um, so they're selling back to you at the same rate that you sell to them? That's right. Now, it isn't all year round. So the, the challenge with solar is the sun only sh shines during the day and it isn't always a sunny day. So what they're doing is actually saving money uh, for part of the time by using their own generation rather than what we provide. But when the sun kicks out and they need the electricity, it's here ready and delivered to them from Eastern Utilities. And you're also uh, getting the power from the windmills in, in Tulsa County, right? That's right. The, uh, the county has just constructed three windmills. It's generating electricity and we're buying the electricity from those Is windmills. Is it generating lots of electricity? It's generating a bit. Um, windmill technology is still uh, just evolving and it takes a lot of windmills to make a good amount of electricity, but every little bit helps. When we come back, join me for a ride up the poles.
Excuse me. How are you? How'd you get here? I, uh, I've always wondered how these things work up here. What are you doing? I to repair this underground that just faulted earlier today. This cable right here? Yeah. Went bad. Blew this fuse that we have in here. So I refused it. I'm testing the cable now once they make the repair. I'll hook it back in the bottom. Hopefully we'll... Let me see the, uh, the fuse again. There's a small fuse in here. It's in here and the tail comes out the bottom, wraps around here, but when it blows, it goes bad, it burns the inside of it, and this little tail here will hang out on the bottom. Okay, so you have to put a new fuse in it? Yes, sir. Then we put it back on. After they've repaired it, <clears throat> We'll hang it up in here. Then we have what's called a, a hot stick. The telescope's out. We'll hook it in the little hole here and close the door. If we fix the fault, it'll hold. If we didn't, it'll blow. So what's the chance of you getting shocked while you're up here? That's why I have all my rubber goods on. You wear them all the time. Snake all your lines up, put all your hood covers on. Where your rubber gloves here. So that keeps you from getting electrocuted? Yes, sir. Now, I know that uh, some time ago we had a complete failure in Easton. And uh, I've seen birds land on these things, so that, but th there's no insulation here? No. So how much power is going through there? 4,800 volts through each one of these wires. If you test from one wire to the ground, which is right underneath of you, you'll get 4,800 volts. If you go from this phase to this phase, you'll get 8,320 volts. But both of which are lethal? Yes. Okay, so what happened when that power went out? Well, this is a distribution line. <clears throat> what happened was down around St. Michael's above lit on the transmission line, which is like 69,000 volts, can go up to 125,000 volts. He decided he wanted to spread his wings out and dry himself out, and he went from this wire to this wire, which you can't do, and it tripped the substation was blue, the whole town of Easton, St. Michael's, Bosman, all that out. So he never knew what hit him? He never knew what hit him. It was quick. <laughs> How long have you been doing this? 22 years. And what's your name? David Cummings. David, nice to meet you. I'm Will nice Howard. Nice to meet you. Now we've learned that most of the wires are uninsulated and how to be very careful that a ladder or any device that's metal does not come in contact from the ground with that wire. We'll see a demonstration. If you're ever working around open wire secondary, which is what you see there in between uh, the middle two poles with a ladder or any kind of metallic object, a long antenna, uh, it, you, you want to make sure that you keep any metallic objects, ladders away from those, uh, from those secondaries. They, even though they contain low voltage, it still could be quite dangerous if you were to make contact with it. You'll see those sparks there. In this, uh, in this demonstration, you know, you can cause a fire, you can, you can get burned, uh, or you can get electrocuted from that. So it's, it's just something to be aware of. You keep uh, metallic objects away from there. <clears throat> Next thing we're gonna show you is above the, uh, the open wire secondary, we've got our primary voltage. In this case, this trailer is uh, energized to 7,200 volts to ground. Um, if you were to even get near, uh, or, or a metallic object even is near that, uh, that overhead primary, it can draw an arc. You can see the, uh, the fire coming off of that. Whoa. Another thing we want to remind people, many people think that wood is uh, an insulator, and in some cases it is, but especially at high voltage, it'll still conduct current and conduct electricity. We're gonna remove the, uh, the fuse cut out the door there, and uh, just take a branch from a tree and, and put in between there and kind of demonstrate that current will flow through that piece of wood and light those lights up on the meter. The last thing we want to do is uh, kind of show you the dangers of, of what can happen if you do make contact with, uh, with the primary voltage. We have a hot dog here, and uh, that, that kind of has a similar uh, consistency to uh, the human body. It, it contains a lot of water. 
Um, and uh, you know, this can give you a pretty good idea of what it would be like to be burned off of this high voltage. So you can imagine uh, you wouldn't want that to be your finger, that's for sure. We learned a lot about power today. Fascinating. Next episode, we're going to learn a lot about water, turning on the faucet, and flushing. Well, you know. You got to do this in the in the snow and the, the rain, rain. Everything. You got to do this in the rain. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Well, Put David. Rain coat on and go to town. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> sure thing. Okay. Nice meeting you. Okay. Nice meeting you. Put some socks on. Okay. Next time. <laughs> <laughs>